muchas gracias por invitarme. Es un placer estar aquí en el Centro de Velocidad de Maíz. That's the wrong talk. un placer ver, ver muchos amigos de Simit y de Colpos y Chapingo. Listo, ok, muy bien. Bueno, yo quiero platicar un poquito, oh, I'm going to go in English, like two slides in my bad Spanish, and then I'll go to English. No, actually, I'm going to start in English. Uh, let me just do it in English. So, um, here I just want to talk a little bit about uh, this Uh, ear of maize is segregating for uh, a number of major gene effects on things like uh, you have sugary in here, lots of different uh, kernel colors. And the point of that from phen you know, variation that's observable down to some genes. Over here on the right side, this set of uh, histograms of plant height in a series of maize by parental crosses. And you can see that in every cross, you essentially have a continuous normal type distribution of plant height. So uh, the, the variability we see in these quantitative traits is very, very different. And what I want to talk about is, is what have we been able to do in terms of going from these observable uh, complex trait variances down to the gene level. And then if we're able to do that, can we use that sort of information for, for breeding? Uh, esa es una propaganda. So, eh, estamos escribiendo un libro de genética cuantitativa y análisis de datos. Eh, en este momento, si, si haces un Google search de Fikret, Fikret, es 100 dólares, algo ridículo. Ahora es gratis. Get it now. Ok. That's nothing great. Genetic analysis in maize. And I'm remembering, I was here, I was actually at the colegio de a small sample of lines, it's only 26 founders, but it's basically trying to maximize as much diversity, global diversity, as we possibly can in, in this sample. Cross them to B73, and that's important. We use this reference founder so that we can get reasonable adaptation on all the mapping populations of this haplotypic region or this chromosomal region. Then we do selfing for a number of generations until we develop recombinant inbred lines. And what these things represent, so we have 200 lines from each of these crosses, and they represent a mosaic what we've done is that this is all matched with a, you know, we have a common set of markers on these things. They're all phenotyped in the same set of environments. So it's much easier than trying to pull together a bunch of distinct biparental mapping populations and try to analyze them. Study, and these are actually small plots, so it's actually a lot of plots crammed into a, uh, a single field here in Clayton. So it was on chromosomes of maize, so these little bars separate the, the chromosomes. And you're doing just a linkage scan and looking for evidence that there is a QTL in a particular region where you allow each family to have a, a unique effect for the allele. And you can see we get these really crazy, huge LOD scores and we get very excited. So even at very, very stringent statistical thresholds, we identified many QTL for what we thought was a relatively simple trait, which was flowering time. So something on the order of 40 QTL, depending on where you draw the line. Another important thing we found was even for this, what again we thought was a relatively simple trait, there's very few large effects. The largest allelic effect genes, each of which tends to have small effects. Um, we got excited because you can actually predict, if you take this QTL model and just predict back what the parental phenotypes are, you get a very nice, where region is sort of defined by the, the by linkage, right? So um, it depends on centimorgans. So you will pick up effects that can be within, you know, five, 10 centimorgans of the marker. Um, we want to do something more precise, which was to do a genome-wide association type study where the idea is to get an association test at much higher resolution. In other words, we want to identify the effects of much smaller regions of the genome. And the way we did this is we had um, sequence data on these founders. So you can think about, um, we'll get there in a second. Uh, let me start. We have this linkage map data I already told you about. We have something, there was something like originally a thousand, it was like 1200 markers um, on all the progenies. And these things were directly genotyped. So we had real data on all the progenies from these. We had real data on the parents too. So you can track for any, uh, here's, a, here's a particular parent and that gets crossed with this B73 and you generate a series of these 
progenies, you could track in this genome region, we know where this line, which founder allele is in, or, or haplotype in that region is being inherited. But on the founders, we also have this very high coverage, high dense uh, sequence data where we had millions and millions of these SNP variants called. And what you can do then is just impute with pretty high confidence these, this information between the linkage markers. You're just basically saying if, if I have these two linkage alleles here in this uh, line, then I'm going to inherit this block of, of the founder and I can look at these um, individual SNP variants that are in between the things we actually genotyped. So you have, on the one hand, you have this sort of linkage-based kind of QTL mapping with the thousand or so markers. You have basically QTL-type resolution where you're probably going to be within five, ten centimorgans of a causal effect. But this GWAS analysis, you can control for the genetic background for the other QTL you've mapped, but go in in a region and look more precisely um, because the, the linkage to sequilibrium that occurs at a single SNP depends on the linkage, uh, the linkage to sequilibrium in these founders, which is much, much lower than the, than the map type resolution. So that's nice. And so in some cases, we've been able to go from basically observable phenotype variation, map the thing at linkage resolution, so you get down to a few centimorgans, and then get down to the causal gene. Here's one success story. This is this gene, CMCCT, which uh, control is the major QTL for photoperiod response in maize. This little graph here is, these are the 10 chromosomes of maize. Here's one through five, six through 10. Here's a linkage map down here. These green boxes are the QTL. You can see these QTL are kind of big chunks of the genome. These red dots are the GWAS analyses and the higher up they are, then the more important they are. And you can't see it because they made it so small, but there's one here that's basically has very, very high evidence for a single variant that's associated with this flowering time uh, photoperiod response. Um, but that, you know, it's still, that's just an association. It's a correlation type study. It required doing very high resolution fine mapping where you control the genetic background and you basically select for recombinations in the region where you've got that, that QTL. And John Dobley's group did this. And the other thing they had was they had a teosinte allele integrated into maize. That teosinte allele had a really big effect. So having that big phenotype effect and having high resolution mapping allowed them to identify the causal variation is either in the first exon or in the promoter of this ZMCCT gene. And then independently, a group from China uh, basically did transgenic work to show that if you, if you um, uh, do a overexpression or underexpression based on what the promoter is of this gene, you can, you can cause this phenotype. So that's a great case of where we went from uh, just the variability in phenotype down to the, the actual gene. But consider this was a huge amount of work and we didn't really get the gene directly out of the statistical analysis. It, had to, it required further work to get there. So here's, a, here's another case where we're looking at southern leaf blight resistance. All of this is quantitative. There's no immunity. There's no, we're not looking at any major genes for resistance. It's basically one to nine type scale. Uh, we inoculate these plots, and uh, this is with a colleague, Peter Balancurdi. His people will go through and rate stuff multiple times during the season. It's a huge amount of work. We do a bunch of analysis. You do this genome-wide association study, and then you, you get a graph like this where, the, again, just I'm not going to go into the details, but the higher up you are on this plot, the more evidence there is that that SNP variant is involved in the Phenot, you know, variation seen in the phenotype. And what we've done is we put annotations on the gene that these SNPs are in on this thing. So this was exciting. Uh, you know, a plant pathologist looks at this and says, oh, there's, you know, plausible reasons that some of these things can be involved in uh, quantitative type disease resistance. And focusing on this one here, this cafe oil CoA O methyltransferase, the idea was can we do some functional biological validation. Actually, we is not correct. That the Peter Ballant Curdy and Chin Yang, a postdoc in his group, they basically have done the follow-up validations. And here's just one example of what they've done. So you know what gene you're interested in. In maize, you can go to a resource called the Uniform Mu Stocks, where the mu transposon has been released in a in a uniform genetic background. And if you tell them what gene you're interested in, they can tell you which stocks carry insertions either in the gene or near the gene. And there were two stocks that had insertions in the three, pot, three prime untranslated region. Um, 
You know, we didn't know if that was going to cause any effect or not, but it turns out it did. Um, so if you compare the two stocks that have the insertion at the three prime end of this thing, they actually have higher resistance. So the higher up you are in the scale, the better you are. And um, if you look at them in the field, you can take pictures like this and it looks really nice. And what, what's weird about this is having this transpose on insertion in the three prime end actually increases the expression. So this is, a, this is unpublished. It's not a 100% sure, but this looks like a case where, again, we've gone from a complicated phenotype all the way down to a gene. And this phenotype, we had no idea what the biological pathways were in the beginning. The photoperiod response, there's a lot of work in Arabidopsis and rice and things like that where we could rely on saying, yeah, this is a good candidate gene. In this case, we don't really know much of anything about what causes this kind of variation. So it's a, um, it's very handy or very useful to be able to do forward genetics where you just go from phenotype, you don't know anything about the biology, and just use um, uh, genetics, get down to some gene, and then you discover something potentially novel. So those are a couple exciting success stories, 10 years of work, millions of US dollars, you know, go into this thing and, you know, we write lots of papers and I get invited to conferences, I don't know why, because more often than not, what happens is, uh, I don't translate that, but what happens is, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this later, what, what, what we're doing, but when you do these genome-wide association studies, you have to make sure you're accounting for the background polygenic variants. And what happens a lot, I have students who do this a lot, they do the analysis, and once they fit the background polygenic variants term, there's no variability left over to be accounted for by single gene variants. So the, the polygenic part of the model takes up nearly everything, and there's no power to detect single gene variants. And the student, this, happened, this just happened a few months ago, you know, I'm in trouble, I'm gonna be fired, I'm a disaster because I didn't find a gene, right? So, um, yeah, you have this problem. Where's my gene? You know, it's genetic. You know there's genetics. It's heritable. But there's no genes. Where, where did it go? And, you know, the, the, the answer is, well, actually, you have an answer. The answer is that it is, there's lots of genes, and they're very small effects. And you simply don't have power to identify any specific one. And, again, thinking about it in terms of breeding, if what we're trying to do is identify genes with large enough effects that are going to be, you know, deployable in a breeding program, you've got your answer. The answer is you don't have it, at least in this sample of germplasm. Okay? It's polygenic. So forget about the idea that you're going to identify a major gene from some, you know, uh, exotic germplasm and just move it right into an adaptive variety and you're done. Which was, I confess, my naive idea when I started this. I thought, oh, this is going to work. It's going to be great. I don't think that's going to work. There's some statistical issues. I won't get into it. And I just want to point out this, too, that we publish the ones that work. And a lot of times, this, we've tried to fine map things like flowering time TTL. And again, flowering time, we can measure it. It has extremely high heritability. We put all our genetic you know, resources into it. And at the end, basically what happens is you, you start with a QTL. You do fine mapping. You break it down into little regions by recombination. And basically, the effect disappears. Where did it go? Well, the effect was probably caused by lots of linked small effect variants, and as soon as you have recombination break those up, your QTL is no longer a QTL. It's a bunch of small effect variants, and that's your answer. And we don't know what they are. But practically, it doesn't matter what they are, because they're no of use. Okay, so there's all this disaster that you never hear about. So I'm here to tell you that it happens. A lot of projects end like the car and the, the fancy car, you know, a very fancy sports car, and you drive it into a lake. Uh, I won't go into that. One other thing that, okay, the QTL analysis, you know, we identified 40 QTL, for example, for flowering time. That looked great. Um, we thought, well, let's take a little more careful look at it because what can happen when we do those analyses where you put all the families together and you're looking for a QTL that has uh, kind of information uh, across all these families, that's like what we're doing in the bottom of this graph here. I'll tell you what the other parts is, but this JF thing here is this thing. So here are 10 chromosomes of maize, and what I'm showing you here is if you take your data set, ah, sorry. if you take your data set and you randomly sample 80% of the lines, and you do the QTL analysis, and you say, you know, here's my threshold, here's what I declare as a QTL, and you keep track of that. And then you take another random sample of 80%, and you redo the QTL analysis, and you say, here's what I declare a QTL. And you do this, let's say, 100 times, 80% samples of your data set every time, you ask the question, what 
you know, for each marker in the genome, that's what these little bars are, what, how much evidence do I have that they show up? What's the proportion of data subsets in which they show up? So a dark blue line is above 50%. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I've got eight markers that show up more than 50% of the time. Everything else, these little blue guys, those are more than 5%, but less than 50%. There's a lot of those. And then there's a lot of stuff that shows up one time and never shows up again. So if you've done your analysis on the 100% of your data set and you publish that, which we've done, and you say, these are the QTL, well, I could take your same data set, I could probably find another 1,000 QTL if I just keep reanalyzing your data. So the point here is that it's pretty complex and that's not the end of it. What we also did was we took each family separately. So we just take the, take the families apart, analyze them one at a time, and you ask the question, how often do you find the QTL in this one family? And so here's the B73 by B97 family. Okay, it looks like we have more or less something going on here on chromosome one, and maybe a few other things. We don't have much power here. We know that's an issue. But basically this position looks like it shows up in one other family. And this is something we see really commonly that you can find QTL that are population specific and you know, you're not gonna see them in some other population. So, so what if they explain 5% of the variation in this one cross, they probably aren't even segregating in some other cross. So uh, you know, how is that information used for breeding? Probably not. Okay, one other thing, if I have time. This is one more example of trying to get the point across that even what we think as relatively simple traits, at least traits that we can measure with high heritability, are actually quite complicated. This is a story where um, Arnold Hallauer at Iowa State took a, a set of accessions of Tucson, which is a lowland tropical race, and took them to Iowa. So that's exotic germplasm. Um, and, you know, photo period's all wrong. They flower way, way too late. But what he did was he planted basically an isolation field of 10,000 plants and would walk through it every day and uh, flag the earliest 500 plants that flowered. So there was very large population size, very strong selection pressure, but, but big effective population size. So drift is not a big problem here. And he did that for 10 generations, okay? And here's, a, here's an analysis we did on this side of the, the graph here where we start, the, here's the initial cycle, and actually the population size here is, a, the sample is a little low because a lot of them didn't germinate, but um, as we go through, the 10th cycle of selection, you can see the distribution of the population just shift very quickly uh, in terms of earlier flowering, which is what he was selected for. So you see this dramatic response to selection. And actually, one of the reviews on this paper said, has to be simple, must be a major gene, all right? All right, so we throw 45,000 SNP markers at it. And so not only do we have the things phenotyped, we have the same things all genotyped, and we can do population genetic analyses on these we can also do GWAS because we have individual lines in the field from this thing sampled and we have them genotyped. And the first thing I'll tell you is when we do the GWAS, when we put the population structure correction in, guess how many things we find that are significant? Maybe two, right? Maybe two, it depends. You know, we argue about what's our FDR. 20% FDR, we can maybe find five, 10, something like that. It's not many. So again, this argues, yeah, it's single gene, it's very simple. If you do the population genetic study where you ask the question, is there a change in allele frequency at this SNP that's bigger than can be explained by drift, you basically come up with thousands and thousands of SNPs. And they're not all clustered, they're all over the genome. Okay, essentially the entire genome is under selection. Which means there's lots of genes and they probably have lots of small effects. And Arnold Hallauer put very strong selection pressure in a big population and you can actually make pretty substantial gain doing that. Okay, oh, and that's not published yet, we're working on it. All right, so that's kind of looking, that's a couple ways you can look at structured families for mapping. You can go into these recurrent selection populations. Uh, you can do these sorts of analyses. Probably the most common thing people do is just association analysis, where you take a sample of, let's say, lines from a breeding program or from a, from a germplasm bank, you put them in the field, you evaluate them, you run a bunch of markers on them, you do a, what they call a genome-wide association study, and you know you publish some papers, and we have done this. Um, and the advantage to these diversity panels is you sample. You're sampling much greater diversity. That's great. You sample more alleles. The resolution can be much higher, particularly in maize, because the linkage disequilibrium breaks down very fast in diverse material. 
You don't have to spend all these years making inbred lines out of crosses, which was a lot of work. However, there's some penalties to it. You have to deal with the population substructure. To avoid identifying SNPs being associated with your trait, due to the fact that they happen to be specific to a subpopulation that has some particular value for that trait, which is the, the population structure false positive effect. So um, what I'll show you what we have to do is we have to statistically account for that population structure so that you're not picking up those effects uh, and thinking that you've got a causal variation or you're very close to a causal variation. The other problem you can have is you have lots of low frequency alleles. If you look at, if you just look at the SNP, Frequencies in these diverse panels, the vast majority of SNPs are very rare. They occur in maybe just a few lines, particularly if you go into exotic germplasm. And the problem there is, there's a lot, means there's a lot of diversity that's very interesting, but it's very specific to one or two lines, which means you have no statistical power to identify those things in these sample sizes. And then this last thing, and Renee has made this point very well, and I'm glad she did, you have to deal with adaptation somehow. So if you're gonna look at uh, you know, some kernel associated phenotype and you're growing exotic germplasm in North Carolina or Iowa and it doesn't flower. Okay, so we can identify all the alleles involved in not making seed, but I don't think it really means anything. It just means we're, it, we're evaluating these things in the wrong environment. So you have, to, you have to deal with these things. And a lot of what we've done is try to just look at traits where we think maybe we can pretend we don't have to deal with adaptation. Okay, so we got to correct for population structure, and I showed you we did that nested association mapping study. That's easy. We know the family structure because we made the families, and you can just put it as a fixed effect in the model. However, if you get to these diversity panels, it's very complex. You have many layers of recent and deep relationships among lines. Let me just go back and show you this guy. This is a sample of the, all the inbred lines in the USDA seed bank, and this is just two principal components, but you have this it's not, you can see clear subgroups, but you have all this stuff that's kind of intermixed and you don't, you don't know what to call it. Is it stiff stock? Is it non-stiff stock? And it's mixed with tropical and it's, you know, that sort of thing. It's very, very deep layers of relationships. So um, the most effective way to deal with that is to measure the pairwise genetic similarity for all the lines. And then we'll include a random polygenic background term that says the variance covariant structure of my genetic background effects is proportional to this uh, genomic relationship matrix. Okay, and I'm actually gonna show you a, an equation where we, where we do that. And then the idea is, so you've got this background genetic variation term that reflects how the, how the material in your sample are related to each other. And then what the GWAS is doing is saying, when you, take that part of the variation away, whatever variation is left over, can we explain that variation with the differences in the alleles at a particular SNP? Okay, so going back here. So the phenotypic similarity between individuals is mostly based on the proportion of shared alleles, right? Fisher wrote this paper 98 years ago, and we think he's right. So that <clears throat> if you take two uh, clones, or identical twins, the phenotypically they look very, very similar, okay? And we, you, know, you know this in your family. And then if you go to full SIBs, you can say, yeah, that's a family. You know, people, you can recognize a family, but there is some variation, they're not all identical. So I kind of look like my brothers, but um, not exactly. And then if you go to um, first cousins, you know, it's a little bit harder to tell. Probably you can't tell that they're closely related and you get more variation within the family. Okay, so we all know that. That's what everything on classical quantitative genetics is based on. You know the pedigree expectations, you know, half sibs or, you know, have a genetic correlation of 0.25, full sibs, 0.5, you know, this sort of stuff. But those pedigree relationships are expectations. Oh, also, with that information, the animal breeders, they've run on that for, you know, 50 years and it worked really well. Given pedigree information, you can do genomic, not genomic, pedigree-based predictions. And, and it works. But those pedigree relationships, they're expectations or they're averages over all the possible outcomes. Any specific pair of relatives is gonna vary around that. So uh, me and my brothers, every pair of us are not exactly correlated additively by 0.5. Some of us are probably 0.45 and some of us are 0.55, okay? There's variation within that family around that. And what we can do is if you have genome-wide markers, you can estimate the realized genomic relationships among those things. 
So that's exciting. So here's, here's just a simple example. There's a million examples of this. I just took one of uh, the marker data from one of these biparental families from the nested association mapping population, and I asked for each line what proportion of the alleles came from B73, which is one of the parents. And we expect it should be 0.5 based on pedigree. And the mean is 50.1%. Fisher was right, amazingly, without any marker data. But there's this huge variation around that. And it's this variability around those expectations is where the realized genomic relationships and that genome-wide markers become really powerful. Okay, here's what we do. We're gonna do a GWAS. And when we do the GWAS, here's our model up here. And it's, you know, the equation's not that hard. This is the part we're interested in the GWAS. This is saying, I'm looking at, I code my SNP that I'm interested in. I have some individuals, I call it zero. They have one allele. The other individuals, let's say they get a one, they have the other allele. And I'm looking for differences at that marker. Whoops, I get my arrow back. Okay, what's this thing? This part is the mixed model part. This U is the effect of each line in my sample. So here's, an, here's a case where we had 200 and 79 maize inbreds from all over the world. You just take a bunch of marker data, you estimate how related they are. And so what this is is a heat map showing with colors how strong the relationships are. So when you get down to like white, it's basically zero relationship. They're unrelated. If you have things that are kind of hot red, those things are related. And I didn't order, I think they're alphabetically ordered. And so there's some group here, I don't even know what it is, but these guys, this part of the matrix these guys are all related. So each row and each column is one of the individuals in your sample. And you're saying, if I look at the variability in my trait, if the differences between any pair of individuals fits what kind of what I predicted in terms of the proportion of this matrix, that's background effects. So, so the background effect gets uh, uh, absorbed in this variance component. So these background effects are random effects and they have a variance covariance matrix proportional to the realized relationship matrix. And I may have just lost a bunch of people there. This is really important. So uh, I'm gonna go back over it again. So, okay. But the point here is what we care, we don't care about that part where we're, we're like removing it. It's like a residual part of the model. We wanna get rid of it. And what we really care about, right, is we wanna find that SNP so we can publish a paper and get our PhD and get out of grad school. That's this part of the model. Right? That's trying to hit that, you know, ZMCCT or that, or that disease resistance gene. Okay, so our interest in the GWAS is the SNP effects data. Now, now we're going to move into genomic prediction. I'm making a little shift here, and I haven't warned you, but here it comes. And the reason it happens right now is because it's almost exactly the same statistical model, right? So we have some vector of phenotypes. We have some mu. That's the same thing. We have some residual. We can't explain. The ZU part, oh my gosh, it's exactly the same thing we do in GWAS. What you have is a set, you have this matrix, so we have 279 lines in the rows and in the columns, and this little cell here is telling me how many alleles, what proportion of the alleles are shared between individual one and individual two. What proportion of the alleles are shared between individual one and individual 279? That's this piece of the box over here. And again, you're asking the question, are the phenotypic differences that I see, are they proportional to the amount of the genome that's shared? So if I see that, oh yeah, they share a lot of the genome, and oh yeah, they look the same, that's polygenic background. If I see that, well, they share a lot of the genome, but actually they don't look that similar, that's not polygenic background. So that's either going into residual, or it's something you maybe can explain in the SNP effects. They're, again, almost exactly the same genetic model, and an aside, You'll see there's lots of ways to do genomic prediction. This is not the only one. It's actually equivalent to some other ways that look more complicated, but this, this thing works. GWAS and genomic prediction are very similar models, but the objectives are completely different. In one case, you're trying to identify specific genes or variants that cause an important effect on your trait. And you want to understand, you want to do like what I'm saying, genetic analysis. Let's find out what the genes are. And if they're big enough effects, maybe we can then use those in, in breeding. The other part of the model, or the, G, the genomic prediction model, is saying, I don't care about any one individual effect. I think my trait is mostly polygenic. Any one SNP has, is 
much importance as any other SNP. It's totally democratic. It's a vote, right? And so I'm going to predict a line somewhere in this matrix where I don't have any phenotype. It should be similar to the guys it's related to. That's all that genomic prediction is. You say, I have all these relationships. On some of them, I have phenotype data. And so I can measure how, how well that phenotype similarity matches the genomic similarity. And then I predict. And I predict that they're basically, if they're genetically related, they're going to have similar phenotypes. Something like that. I mean, the details are really complicated, but that's the basic idea. Um, so let's talk a little bit about genomic selection or genomic prediction. Because if we get into this world, like I told you, it looks like a lot of traits have many genes, each with small effects. It's really the polygenic model. And it seems like genomic selection is going to be a more appropriate way to use genome-wide markers than doing GWAS. Okay, so it's already been shown, <clears throat> lots of papers on this. It works well when the training data set is closely related to the prediction population. So in other words, you have some subset of your data where you have markers and you have phenotypes. You build a prediction model. You say, what function of my markers predicts the uh, phenotypes? And typically, it's simply the more alleles they share, the more similar they're going to be for, for the phenotypes. Then you have another set of your data where you have no phenotype data. So maybe this is a case where you have early generation materials. Some subsets of them have been phenotyped, but the phenotyping is expensive, and supposedly markers are really cheap, and in some cases they are. So maybe I can just take that marker data, build the model where I have all the data, and predict the cases where I don't have the phenotype data. And it works well if those two sets of materials are closely related. And uh, the pioneer people can tell you, I don't know anything about this, but I, they're doing this. Um, <clears throat> but the trick is, you have to have the training data set closely related to your, uh, uh, the things you're, you're applying the model on. Okay? You need narrow genetic space. You need, you would like to have long linkage disequilibrium blocks. So what this means when we go to more diverse material is that, oops, we don't have gen narrow genetic space. We we have LD breaking down very quickly in maize, and that causes problems for these predictions if your training set and the prediction set are not closely related. Here's an example from, from the NAM, NAM where you take each biparental family separately, you measure plant height. <coughs> Heritability is like, I don't know, it's like 90%. It's really high. But you build a prediction model on one family, and you try to predict on another family. And what you see in this graph is that in general, like you get down to these white squares here, there's basically no prediction ability that goes across families in these cases. There are a few cases, there's a few cases where you can get up into the 30%. Um, you tip, like in this case, it's a sweet corn family being compared to another sweet corn family. Um, but in general, it does not work very well. Um, it can get worse. Here's a paper out of the CIMIT group where they took uh, lines from lots of different CIMIT programs, uh, built a genetic prediction model and then tried to predict new biparental families and the prediction um, correlation between what they predicted and what they actually measured ranged from negative 0.26 to positive 0.29. The average was actually negative. This means somebody did a lot of work to collect marker data, collect phenotype data, and in this case, if you had used that genomic prediction model, you, uh, on average, you would have been worse off than, than by selecting completely at random. Okay, so you're spending money in this case to do something worse than, you know, like my kid could do, picking the seed pack. Well, my kid, my kid would do a good job, better than me, but a monkey or something like that. Okay, so the training sets have to be closely related to the prediction sets, and this is really a problem, because if you get into diverse genetic material, if we talk about, you know, 50 races of maize, each of those races, there's hundreds of accessions. You get into each one of these, they're all like separate cases. And a prediction model in any one case is not going to do anything for another case. So this is hard. Um, maybe I could, how much time do I have? Should I quit? Keep going? Keep, keep feeding this poor thing? So I didn't want to completely give up, but that's all the bad news. So here's like, okay, I'm going to try to like get something out of this GWAS type model. What we thought was, okay, Maybe most of the genetic architecture is lots of genes with small effects, but maybe you have, in some cases, a few genes with slightly larger effects. They're not big effects, but maybe just big enough where if maybe they would account for more than that just genetic background. 
So what we did was we took our, um, this NAM data and we did a, a thing where you, this cross-validation type stuff, which is just a way to see if this is gonna work in reality. So you take the data you have and then pretend you don't have phenotype data on some of it. So you split your data into a training set, 80% of the data goes into a training set, you hold out 20% here, and you're gonna try to build a prediction model on this material and try to predict this test set over here. So what we did was we basically did, every time in the training set we redid the GWAS analysis, we identified some markers, we tried to estimate their effect, and we put them into the prediction model in addition to the polygenic background scan. And we said, okay, we're gonna compare not doing that, which is you just do one analysis on the 80% and you just do the prediction model versus you do a GWAS and then try to fit those effects in and then compare those things. So can we pick out any signals of association using GWAS and improve our prediction that we could do with the polygenic model? So we started with a simulation study because you know you want to publish, you gotta, you gotta show some simulation. So my student, Yang Bian, uh, did this simulation where he, did, he said, okay, let's take the easy case. 10 loci, each of which explains 3% of the variance. And then, so there's a part that's oligogenic and then there's another part that's polygenic. And we do this. And what happens is here's our GBLUP model. Here's the prediction accuracy, it's like 33%. If we do the GWAS, and here's our threshold for declaring a significant result, we greatly increase the predicted uh, accuracy. So if you have a few genes and they have a least little bit big effects, you may be able to pick them, you may be able to hit them with GWAS and put them into your model and you can do some real good uh, improving the prediction model. So you get this boost in accuracy. Here's the other part of the simulation. What happens if we make a really polygenic model, so you have a random background term and then you have 100 loci, each of which explains 0.3% of the variance. Then what happens is here's the GBLUP model prediction it's good because it is a polygenic, the model fits the genetic architecture. And here's what happens when you start trying to fit GWAS associations into it. Um, you don't get any gain. In fact, you could do much worse. So the bottom line is you want to use GWAS in the case where you can find some significant effects. Now you don't know this before you maybe do the study, but the idea is go ahead, do the study, do the G GWAS scan, and if you find some significant associations, so here's southern leaf blight, so now we're into real data, so we did it with southern leaf blight, with gray leaf spot, and on average, in each subsampling, we picked up either 21 or 14 associations. When you can pick up things at reasonable stringency, they might be big enough to improve your model, and you get a little boost in prediction. So here we went from like 50% to 53%. I don't know, I don't know if this is worth it or not, but all it is is data analysis, so you're not doing any more work. The problem is when you get into something like plant height. And I know plant height is a component, but actually plant height is incredibly complex itself. So when you get into these more difficult traits, which are, you know, based on these component traits that all interact together, each of those components might be very complex. So here's plant height. You rarely can find anything with the GWAS. That means the polygenic part is good. And that means fitting the GWAS associations don't do anything. And so there's no point in doing it. It's all polygenic. Okay, so here's the summary. I just wanna say everything I've said here is very maize specific and maize is I think quite different from wheat and, and other self-pollinating species. So if you're a wheat person, you might be able to ignore most of this. Uh, yeah, so that's what I've learned. It's taken me 10 years or 20, something like that. This is, it's hilarious to put this up, right? But really, 10 years, years ago, ago, I thought, well, complex traits are complex, but, but again, we can, we can break them down. We can figure out what the major genes are, and we're gonna, we're gonna take complex traits and simplify them with genetics. So, uh, basically, that has happened in some special cases, but the large majority of the cases, the complex traits just are just complex. complex. And there's no way around it, okay? Um, the polygenic model often explains most of the observed variation, for most of the traits, not all of them, you know, like the tar spot example and maybe MLN. There may be cases where you can find major gene effects and that's great. If you can find them, use them. Um, what we've also found, I haven't really talked about this, but if you start really doing some statistics on these things, uh, very carefully, you, you get very scared very quickly, especially if you're like me and you've published a bunch of these papers. And then you have a student who says, well, what happens when we resample the data? And then, 
So there's a lot of things that, again, you'll find an association in one analysis, the same data, the same environment, the same material, except you did a little resampling on them, and boom, that thing is gone. It disappears. That's very scary. So don't, don't believe your own results, I guess is what I've learned. Um, so the, the polygenic model looks like it has a lot of promise for genomic prediction, and industry is, you know, they're, they're really going to town with this thing. But the thing, it doesn't solve our problem when we get into diverse genetic material because it, the prediction models will break down if you don't have a training set very closely related to your um, testing set. Why this is, this gets into some deep uh, parts of the genetic architecture, and we, we actually don't know why this is. It may simply be that allele frequency differences between a training set and a test set are that enough. It will mess it up. Um, Trudy McKay will tell you it's all epistasis, so that's why it doesn't work. Um, and she may be right, I don't know. It, it also could just be that the LD patterns, are, the linkage to equilibrium patterns are different. So there's a lot of reasons. And you know, we're probably gonna spend the next 10 years doing academic studies on why this thing doesn't work, which is, isn't gonna really help anybody. Um, so we still are left with this question. Can we identify causal genes of some larger effect that's gonna help in prediction of more diverse germplasm? Maybe, is the answer. And there are some cases. I just wanna really emphasize that so far those cases have been the the special cases. Um, one last thing is that the people who really want to believe in large effect things will say, you have missed all the rare alleles with large effects. And there are, we know this, this is true, there are rare alleles with large effects and you cannot pick them up in a GWAS because they're rare, okay? And that's true. I doubt it's the case for most of these traits. But it is possible that there are, again, these things that happen so rarely that we miss them. And if you, if you do something like a biparental population, you may pick them up. All right, so for the Spanish speakers, I know I talked a lot and it was very fast and it was bad, hard to understand. So here we go, just to be sure, I'm really clear, I wrote this slide this morning. This is the summary, you didn't have to listen to anything else. Here it is all. Okay, es difícil identificar los genes que causar variación en características complejas en maíz porque hay demasiados genes y tienen efectos muy pequeños, muy chicos, ¿ok? También significa que no existe un, uno poquito, un set poquito de marcadores que son útiles para selección y es porque un grupo chico de marcadores no puede explicar mucho de la variación y probablemente son específicos para una población, ¿ok? Se puede usar marcadores distribuidos por toda la, la genoma para hacer predicción genómica de características complejas. Sí, ese funciona, pero la predicción genómica solo funciona bien cuando el modelo es hecho con una población bien relacionada con la población que se, en, en, en que quieres hacer la selección, ¿ok? I think I'll stop there. I have one more slide on some land race stuff, but it's already too much. People want to eat lunch. Basta ya, no? Bueno, eh, eh, gracias a la gente que trabaja conmigo, un montón de gente que trabaja muy duro para finalmente saber que no hay genes de efectos grandes, es muy deprimidos, pero gracias a todo eso y, y, y los grupos que no das dinero para hacer el experimento. Agradecemos al doctor James eh, ¿Hay espacio para una pregunta? ¿Alguien? Thank you for the presentation. I just wonder. So, yeah, the complex traits, they have a lot of polygenic background and also a lot of interactions possibly would interfer these models. Like, how can we manage the GBI interactions? when we want to maintain the accuracy of the genomic selection. Yeah, so right, I haven't even talked about that. Everything we've done so far, the training data sets have been the same environments as the test sets, the validation sets. All you have to do is put your new population in a new environment and your prediction accuracies drop very quickly. If there is G by E for the trait, which there is for almost everything. So uh, yeah, I mean, this is the other thing. Your training set has to be related to where you're gonna apply it 
both in terms of genetics, which is really what I talked about, but the other part is the environment. And that's very clear. So you probably have to do, again, you have to know your environments, you have to know where your, what, what the target set of environments is, or any predictions you do for some specific environment aren't gonna work. So that's very clear. Yeah, you, you better worry about it. So more data, good data, everything Renee said was exactly right. You need good data, right? And, and you need to be in the right environments. And if you're not, you can sequence all you want, and it's not gonna help. Le hacemos entrega un, de un pequeño obsequio y la constancia de su participación en este evento.